So, Doug, it's an absolute pleasure to finally get you to Cork. It's um, great to be here. During all this madness of the COVID pandemic, um, as you can see, we are in front of um, Doug's installation, Please Gamble Responsibly. Um, I think the gallery first got in contact with you maybe four, four or five years ago. Quite a while, yeah, about the, the Venice Golf project. Yeah, um, Venice Golf um, project. But here we are four years later, yeah. Please Gamble Responsibly. I wonder if you can just say a few words about the themes mm -hmm. that are relevant in this project, and they also respond to your themes during your, um, for your practice generally. Sure. I mean, what you see here is it's basically, um, I wouldn't say a copy, because we, we reworked it to some degree, but it's, it's inspired by the Caratool uh, housing estate, which is outside the city, which wonderfully somebody here told me about at the gallery, because I was interested in investigating that as a sort of symbol of what went wrong in Ireland economically in the boom and bust of the Celtic Tiger years. And I, I, I thought that putting something like this in the gallery would be quite surprising for viewers. And it's a nice way to think about space as well because I'm prom predominantly a filmmaker and to deal with a space that's so big and open was quite a challenge to me. And I thought, you know, thinking through how might I put something up that held the space, but also allowed me to discuss the, um, the themes that I'm interested in. And in particular, I'm, I'm, I've been really interested in thinking about economics and money and finance and how, how it's largely more apparent than real. You know, the notion yeah. of where does money come from? Uh, does money have any real value? Well, of course not, it's all relative and we have to agree that it's valuable. But something like this, which is basically a facade struck me as a nice kind of gambit for thinking through these issues because it has the facade of a, of a structure, of a, of a building or a building complex, but it is ultimately just a, a front. And then inside, uh, in this room here, uh, there's a video which treats all of these kind of themes in, from a different perspective. So this is kind of an architectural, sculptural rendering, if you like, of some of the themes that are in the video. And that to me was a fun way to work because uh, I haven't really worked in this way before. Because usually you're, like, you're kind of described as a conceptual stand-up yeah, artist. Yeah. Um, but this really is the first time you've actually occupied a space to, mm -hmm. this, to this degree. To this scale, and in, yeah. in, a, in, a, in a huge sculptural spectacle. Yeah, yeah. So what were the challenges to you within that mm -hmm. process? Well, I think to me it was, as, you know, when we first discussed this space, really trying to think out what could I do in it that would be interesting effective visually, but also not so far afield from what I like to do that I might get lost. Yeah. Uh, and so for me, a space of this size, really, you know, this, because when you're not seeing this vast thing I've plonked in it, it's quite open. And so... And when you enter this space, you don't see this area here, mm -hmm. so you, you don't know how to penetrate into the space, much like the, the, the character yeah, you know, when monstrosity, we... visual monstrosities, for, um, for those people that don't don't know this, it's, it's a massive apartment block, maybe 80, 90 units in the middle of a kind of uh, s suburban countryside mm -hmm. village yeah, that's the grown castle into a lake. town. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, and it's, it's vast, it's, it's vast. like four stories high. And it's, um, it's ringed by a you know, very uh, similar kind yeah. of corrugated fa yeah. fence to this one. So it is quite a, well, it's a spectacle, it's a very it's, sad spectacle. It is, yeah. I mean, but also for a space like this, which has a few entry points, mm. and you know, a, a thing like this, which is a large architectural complex, it doesn't have one focal point, of course. Mm. So I thought, you know, how can I do something that'll you know, manage the space effectively, but also maybe allow me to kettle or kind of funnel the, the visitors yeah. into an interior space, which is where the video, which kind of ties things together, yeah. well, more you know, more overtly, because it's a narrative so, video and it has. So know. it's a fifteen-minute video, and it uses maybe three hundred images, all probably more, yeah, culled have. from the internet. So mm -hmm. they're all found mm -hmm. images, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and they all kind of. We were talking earlier, uh, just over coffee, about kind of recontextualizing or mm -hmm. taking images out of their original context and putting them into to your um, videos yeah, yeah. and how our perception of those images and with your narrative changes how we 
read those images and mm -hmm. respond to those images. Phantom money, ghost estates. It's a kind of monetary bulimia, and since the early 70s, the system has been crashing with alarming regularity. If you ask me, this is a bizarre foundation for a social order. But at least it keeps a lot of people busy, which maybe is the whole point. You can't blame people for wanting to buy a house, especially in places where renting is a raw deal. But the desire to own a nice place to live has become a ticking financial time bomb. So I wonder if you could just talk about maybe the content of the, the video and some of mm -hmm. the themes. Yeah, and I would just say kind of structurally, I think the, that idea of taking something pre-existing and repositioning it is really the central gesture that I use as an artist. Mm. And, you know, whether I use it in a more comedic way or something a bit less so. But, yeah, this film is, it was quite fun to make because um, I'd been thinking a lot about money and finance. And I started to read books uh, in that discipline, which I'd never really done before, like reading banking literature and books about policy. And it took, it took me a bit of time to acclimatize myself to that. Really, and the more I read about this, the more fascinated I got about how it seems very, very straightforward and you know the banking system what happens when you go and take a loan right that seems like a fairly straightforward thing but the more i dug into it and the more i read about you know banking practices and what actually happens the more fascinated i got that it seems so rickety in a sense or contrived or not at all as solid as one Magical. might be. <laughs> there is a magic to it and again i mean i'm not i don't think you know, this is nothing new to say, mm -hmm. isn't, isn't the function of money mysterious? Well, of course, any kind of group coming together to, and then they determine something has value. But it's, it's when that kind of system of value becomes so predominant and mm -hmm. overtakes our lives to such a degree that I really got um, interested in, you know, chucking my hat into the ring. And especially with things like property, you know, looking at uh, and, you know, just the, the, the pace of financial crashes and things in, the, in my lifetime. I'm not very old, uh, early 50s, but already I've seen a couple of major the financial cyc cyclical. cyclical and, yeah. you know, every couple of years. And I'm, I, I, I ask myself, how is this not completely insane? Mm. And digging into it, it, it allowed me to really um, understand it a lot better. I, I make no pretensions that I have, you know, an economist's understanding of anything, but even to the man on the street, it seems a bit loony. And so I wanted to kind of poke holes in that and do it in a way that I think is engaging and fun, yeah. which is one reason I I'm often rely on very um, stand-up comedy type structures and strategies, you know, using jokes, a certain type of delivery. Mm. Um, it's, it's very much a, strat a strategic orientation in the work. Or just to carry on from there, like, and so a project like this, which has a facade up front, which, you know, it, it came to seem to me more and more the case that the global social and economic order is a facade. Yeah. I mean, it, maybe it always is. I'm not, you know, positing some kind of greater um, solution that we all mm. are just waiting to, I, I hope there is one. But it, it struck me as a, a nice gambit for that discussion. And then when you come inside the video here, in this little room. Um, it's really a meditation on how we are in the situation we're in, but also from, I think, from a historical financial standpoint, which for me is interesting uh, just because I'm, I like to think about such things, but I thought it would be an interesting thing to position in an art context, yeah. because I don't think it's a set of themes that artists usually feel comfortable confronting. And there's a lot of information in in the 15 minutes, but mm. it's done in such a way that, you know, I mean, people say about your tonality of voice mm -hmm. and everything, but also the humor. But also, I think you, you talk also about the universal basic income mm -hmm. as a solution um, to the inequity of, you know, the one percenters, mm -hmm. as you say, pissing all over the rest of yeah, us. Yeah, down on our heads, and, um, trickle down. <laughs> what's, what's interesting is, Ireland is currently looking at this universal yeah, basic yeah. income for, for artists, and um, I believe they're going to test pilot it in hopefully within the next year. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's kind of a really, you know, for want of a better expression, on the money yeah, um, yeah. proposal. Um, 
But how how would we go about that is like a sure. whole different argument and discussion. Yeah, I mean, I come from the States, which is a gigantic country, of course. Imagine the scale and just in the population from yeah. Americans to Irish. And so I wonder, it's, it's probably more feasible in a smaller economy. Mm. Uh, but I think one wonders, could it be rolled out more broadly on a, on a wider level yeah. in larger economies? I hope, I mean, you yeah. know, it's, it's such a complex set of factors, and I, I don't uh, mean to suggest that it isn't. Yeah. But I think one hopes that something that will help people who are in really tough shape, and the people who are not in tough shape are going to be okay anyway. Let's yeah, say. yeah. One of your um, themes throughout your practice seems to be um, unintended consequences. Mm. Um, so, you know, what are the consequences of spending money in a fish and chip shop or what are the mm -hmm. consequences, these hidden consequences that so much we kind of overlook mm -hmm. and you kind of, you know, bring to the bubble to the, the surface. Um, in one of your um, talks, I think it was in Luft Gesch Gesch Geschäft, Ge yes. Geschäft, thank you, in 2019, it ends with um, a clip of um, Clint Eastwood, uh -huh. and um, <laughs> he says... Um, a man's got to know his limitations. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, it's, a great, it's a great clip, and then he blows up the criminal. He grows, blows yeah. up the criminal, yeah. and then he just walks off into this kind of urban, post-industrial, mm -hmm. you know, everything on fire. scene, yeah, yeah, yeah. everything's on fire. <laughs> um, I think, in some ways, your work does actually overturn those, you know, the limitations, but at the same time, it opens up um, possibilities. And like going back to a really early work of yours, I think 2005 or 2004, when you put 30,000 bananas mm -hmm. in a massive pile outside, Trafalgar, outside the National outside Gallery. The National Gallery. So yeah. that kind of opened up possibilities yeah. as well. So I wonder if you can just kind of talk about well, I think I mean I think I'm a, an optimist at the end of the day maybe a kind of uh, imprecise Buddhist optimist um, in thinking about you know how much of our behavior really causes so many of these problems like that notion of not having a sense of limitation right is is I think very central to the foibles that now bedevil us I mean and even in thinking about the current film the, the, the one here I was trying to look at you know, what are the con why are house prices so expensive? Mm. I mean, you, you look in the paper and say, my God, it costs a lot of money to buy a house. But if you look historically at the kind of, you know, things that cause that, or at least some of the ones in my, in my diagnosis, it really does seem it's the consequence of something. Whether it was unintended or not is hard to know because we're not on those inside uh, meetings where everyone's smoking cigars and, <laughs> you know, plotting out the fate of the world if you go in for that sort of thing. But yeah, I mean, I do think that, you know, there is, um, especially growing up in New York and now living in London where I do, and seeing, you know, so much energy and, oh God, and spirit just kind of dissipated through these crazy um, lifestyles. And mm. you kind of wonder why, 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 does it have to be like this? Uh, I had this idea when I was a kid, I, or younger, I don't even remember the, what the project was, but I told a friend I wanted to do an installation called For God's Sakes, Why? And I, I like that title. <laughs> um, but you know, why do, we, why do we spend, why do we do this to such a degree that, that we do? And now as somebody with young children, it's, it's more you know, salient than ever to me. How, how are my kids going to be socialized into an economic way of living that might just enslave them and divert all yeah. the joy and beauty that is possible uh, into something kind of, you know, joyless and, and uh, mechanical. Which kind of connects, I just go back to the bananas because yeah. I'm slightly obsessed with them. Um, <laughs> but just the, you know, the, the, the 30,000 bananas also, from what you were saying earlier, you know, appeared from when you lived in Guatemala. No, Ecuador. Ecuador, Ecuador. sorry. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, this guy would just put Mm -hmm. huge amounts of bananas next to this other guy every morning or whatever, mm -hmm. and he'd sell them and they'd go away. Mm -hmm. So the possibilities of that, but also the limitations. And then when you put them, why did you put them in Trafalgar? Because well, of the context? I think, I mean, th that was a project. Shift. I was living in Ecuador. Um, I went there down um, in around late 90s. 
uh, to do an artist residency. And I was there to learn sculpting and I was doing drawing. I was working with a blacksmith, which was quite interesting. But I hadn't started working yet. This was at the very kind of formative part when I quit my job trying to have a, a proper job. I was a financial advisor briefly, which no doubt informs. <laughs> I don't know if I, I find that funny. Come I don't on. know if you would. You, you at one point could have bought life insurance from me. <laughs> we can talk after the video. But um, so I went, I went down to Ecuador and then you know, it was such an unusual visual reality to me coming from a very different place. And one thing, I, I think a lot of my ideas that I, I think ultimately uh, lead to successful projects just come from something I've seen in the environment. Mm. And as you mentioned, I was walking down, uh, walking probably en route to work in the blacksmith studio and I saw this massive pile of plantains on the roadside and I just stopped dead in my tracks. And I thought, my God, what is, why on earth is this here? But even more than that, like what a magnificent thing just to look at. And you know, in Ecuador, it's not an uncommon sight because where I was living wasn't coastal and that type of produce is trucked in from where it's grown on the coast and brought into mm. mountainous regions like I was in. Put there on the roadside, someone sits there and people come by and buy it. And it was just that idea that it was driven, you know, in, in some ways like this. There's sometimes there's a, a visual punch that, that uh, I'm drawn to that can then hopefully uh, resonate. And with the bananas, I thought, wow, first off, if I could take that image and just position it in a place where people would look at it with eyes that weren't saying, oh, that's just something in the marketplace, but wait, hang on, look at that. Uh, it could do something interesting. And then all the kind of um, metaphorical mm. types of possibilities of, you know, uh, could, could dwell within that visual gesture. And at the time in Ecuador, the, uh, the economy was under great strain. In fact, the um, things got so bad that the government froze bank deposits. People couldn't get their money out. And then eventually, gave up on the local currency and now they have the US dollar as a, as a sovereign currency. They don't have their own national currency. So all these types of things about economics and value and uh, for me, of course, a big, when I did my project, I didn't use plantains, which are green. I used bananas, which are golden. And in fact, I, I was able to do the first iteration of this project in the Central Bank of Ecuador. Okay. Yeah, they had an art program and I brought the idea to them and they said, yeah, this could be fun. So we did it outdoors in the plaza. And that, as a metaphorical gesture, I think, uh, was pretty interesting, this notion of the wealth of a country like Ecuador, which is largely natural resources that are expropriated and sent to, you know, sent out of the country, uh, in the federal bank, uh, where at the time the money itself was decomposing, in a sense. It seemed like it could really hold a lot of metaphorical possibilities while making a visual gesture that was, you know, driven by what I just, in a sense, saw down the road. Yeah. And that to me is even like this, sometimes you just find inspiration that is, is really useful from a, from a visual gesture. And when you sort of put them into the bananas, into the, the London context, yeah. did it then, obviously, you know, they say context is, every, context is everything. Sure. Did it take on a political gesture? I mean, I think it did. And more so because, more so because of like the imperialistic I would say, yeah, you definitely, know, because of the square and everything, and sure. you know the institutions that, and indeed mm -hmm. the the embassies that are all around. Sure, definitely uh, so, because square. you know what I was doing when I did the project in Ecuador was working in the place where this, you know, the supply chain begins in Ecuador. Mm. The, these fruits are grown; they're sold at quite low cost, and then when you get all the way to London, it's gone through sev several intermediaries, and the price is astronomical. Uh, uh, my brother knew somebody, I think, in Venezuela who said that the markup was better than the cocaine industry for selling fruit in, you know, the end point, like yeah, yeah. London, New yeah. York, whatever. You know, imagine you can get a banana in London for like 60p and for one of them if, if you're shopping not very cleverly. But, you know, I, you can get a box of them, yeah. 40 pounds of them in mm. Ecuador for that. And so that, those types of things are just structurally within the economic supply chain and you know, well, all the historical implications. But yeah, what I really liked also about staging it, because um, the project, how many times have I done it? Well, I did it twice in Ecuador, once in Costa Rica, which are banana producing regions. And then I did it several times in places, once in Poland, once in New York, and once in London. Mm. And in each place, what I liked was how different the reading of the 
well, it's not a single banana, of course, because yeah. I'm making vast piles of them. Mm. And um, for instance, in Poland, which was uh, an interesting place to do this, during the um, communist era, bananas were some symbols of real privilege. Because like the pineapple was in the 18th century. You couldn't yeah. get them unless yeah. you were in with the party. Yeah. So to have a pile of bananas in Poland, where they were at one point, not when I did the project, because mm. this was after the fall of the wall, but historically the banana had a meaning there that it never would have had in Ecuador, okay. where they're basically, you could say a dime a dozen, yeah, literally, yeah, yeah. right? So it's, um, it was interesting to position it in different locations and see what happens around them. I think that is, you know, even though the Trafalgar Square banana thing was many years ago, I think most of the large projects I've done since then share that spirit, putting something where it's not quite expected and seeing what sort of arises around it. And in the particular uh, Trafalgar Square thing, we gave away the bananas at the end of the day. You know, I wouldn't want to make any kind of project that would waste mm. food anyway, but certainly not one that talks about economics. Yeah. And so we gave away everything. And in a way, that created a strange energy in a city like London, which is not a sharing kind of town. It's a big, hard-knuckle kind of city. Yeah. Yeah. And so people were really taken aback at this notion that they could have free things. Like, almost like, What's what? the catch? Yeah. Is it, it, who's filming me kind of thing? Yeah. And that was very interesting, because it, it meant to bring together the crowd uh, as a sort of collective sculptor. Yeah. You know, So it's, it had that sort of relational aesthetics type of approach, which was much more uh, in, you know, uh, common in the art practice of the era. It was years ago. But in, interestingly, I remember once I did the project in New York, and my brother helped me to stage it, and he convinced some tourists to take some bananas simply by saying, listen, you'll never be offered anything free again in your life in New York. Take it just for that reason. <laughs> and so, you know, jokingly, yes, but I mean, there was a notion of, mm. you know, thinking about... Uh, economics and deprivation and all those factors that go into a large industry, yeah. especially one based on you know abusive labor practices and everything like that kind of agriculture, and you know having this moment of shared experience in in a kind of a city where we do feel very fractionalized and frac yeah. you know and so that was that was quite a a nice thing to watch unfold. And Another project that you did in London in recent years is in Dulwich picture gallery yeah, which yeah. is an absolutely gorgeous institution it's great yeah um and that was called made in china mm -hmm. which again is that um idea that you have of bringing something out of context mm -hmm. into a different context and just seeing what happens yeah yeah so for this one you commissioned um fine artists in china to recreate maybe a fragonard yeah, yeah. that they had in the collection and to show it in uh, side by side? Well, no, at first the idea was I, I wanted to make a copy of an old master's masterpiece. Mm. And so we worked, we decided to try this Fragonard. We got a copy made in China in a studio that does replica. And then the idea was to see okay, if I take the, uh, the replica and put it where the original should be, would anyone notice? Yeah. And so, again, a very simple gesture, like maybe a little bit less dramatic than taking eight tons of bananas and piling them somewhere. But again, a very similar thing. Let's just put something there and see what happens. And the idea was to say, OK, if you can come and see if you can spot the replica. And that was really the gambit. I mean, there was a lot going on in the project in terms of criticizing you know, our general cultural approach to art and the kind of preciousness and notions of aura and authenticity mm. that I wanted to think that if we go to a museum and venerate things and kowtow in front of them and then found out later, well, actually, that was a fake. I mean, what would that do to, the, do to that experience? Do we feel cheated? Yeah. yeah. Or what are we playing at here? Really? Yeah. You know, and, and what are the rules? You're examining the rules of the game. Indeed, like this piece. Yeah. Like, if we think that an ounce of gold is worth, I don't know, now $1,100, I haven't followed it. Why? You know, yeah. is, is, there any, is there any reality underneath it I mean, we can all play along the surface and the thing sort of holds together because if we didn't play along the surf, it wouldn't hold together. Yeah. God knows what would happen then. And so that was interesting to me because I'd studied, I'd read about, you know, I, uh, things about like wine, wine consumption, which like looking at old masters art in a museum has this 
notion of connoisseurship and that, well, certainly, when you're drinking Chateau d'Iquem or whatever versus the kind of junk you get in the off-license, there should be a difference, right? If not, what, what is this whole architecture of taste and pretension and all that? And I, I read some very interesting studies that people could not, people who studied wine, it's, the test group was a group of students in France doing wine studies. And if they were presented the same wine in bottles of different um, market value, and every single one of them thought the one in the, the most expensive high prestige label mm. was better than the other two, right? But it was the same wine. And then some people couldn't tell the difference between white wine that wasn't served chilled but was tinted to look red and red wine. These things you would think would be laughable to someone who knew about wine. And, you know, if, if wine students can really be led, excuse me, to think that something is something just because of the context and the presentation, you know, certainly the same is true in the museum world. Yeah. And I wanted to see what would happen if we do that. What does it reveal about our own, what we bring to the gallery, rather than the thing that's just sitting there on the wall? Because yeah. almost that, that almost doesn't matter at that point. Because yeah. if you're, you know, and it, it also made me wonder, you know, from a more kind of conspiratorial angle, how do we know what we're looking at is real? It's one thing yeah. I know that what, I look, what I'm putting there is real or not. But in a general kind of art context, how do we know? And some of the research I did, there was one fellow who was, um, at the time of his writing, he was, or either that, or he was just saying he had been the president of the Metropolitan Museum in New York, major character in the yeah. art world. And he said that something like 40% of the pieces that he looked at in his career with the idea of acquiring them for the museum were fake. Wow. And that's amazing because if this whole art world is revolving around, a, to a large degree, fake objects of high value, something very strange is going on. Yeah. And I think it's very tied into a project like this, which is, you know, why is one house worth a million dollars yeah. versus 400,000? All those machinations that go into what seems like a very kind of stable social order, maybe the more you look at it, the more you realize, oh, hang on, it really just is a facade, you knock on it and, and it's, you it's you empty. You kind of referred to this in previous work and there are references in this, of it, this um, terminal, terminology called the progress trap. Mm -hmm. And I suppose we're all caught within that. Sure. And we were talking earlier before we, we did this conversation about how can we change society. Yeah. And I think we agreed that there was a willingness to change society. Mm -hmm but nobody really wanted to go through the transition yeah, to get to the It's very imprecise, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's, it's... As my friend um, Danny always says, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's true that progress trap, these are or what you were talking about before, about the um, unintended consequences, mm. for sure. Like, I think a lot of things are attempted with good intentions. One hopes on the part of the policymakers, how do we know? Yeah. And then things are complex, you know, you know, when you think of the vastness of an economy of the scale of the United States or the EU, I mean, how do things actually percolate? And, uh, and where do they wind up? Probably I mean, pretty as, far afield. As you say in the video here, I mean, uh, quite an astounding fact is in the UK, only 3% of money generated mm -hmm. is actually, for want of a better, Physical. hard copy yeah. cash. And, and that's, so that, that means that we're all in this, tied up in this kind of, experience of money that doesn't exist. Yeah. I mean, it's not the first time I think that, you know, that uh, has been pointed out, certainly, but also mm. there are times in, um, you know, economic history where uh, hard currency was more in demand and, you know, things like the gold standard yeah. and periods where it was a bit more conceptual. So it's not as though it's the only time in history that we were dealing with a kind of more conceptual entity, but I think it, it's for me it's interesting because I was experiencing this as a citizen watching this drive from cash to digital anyway mm. and I certainly think that policymakers have glommed onto that and seen the benefit of depleting cash out of the system altogether because then there'll be no you know off-grid economy yeah. I, I don't know how this could yeah. ever work in, in yeah. countries like India or wherever where mm. so much of the uh, activity is what they call the gray economy. But you know, if you can't get money except from 
this sort of digital fountain, you know, the government or whatever, how are you going to keep, you know, money under the mattress if you need to and go off grid? Yeah. You won't be able to. Yeah. And that to me is terrifying. And I think, you know, it's, I think whether the, even that 3% figure it may have lessened. Maybe we're even closer to zero. There are some, I think in Sweden, they almost use no cash at really? all, and it works, yeah, seemingly. Yeah. I mean, I guess the thing is it works until it doesn't. And then at that point, what happens? And my hope as a person is that some, someday, uh, they'll come up with a, they, they'll come up with, right? I don't know who. Some system that is maybe less insane and more sustainable and doesn't leave so much wreckage, yeah. you know, because if the economy crashes every few years, as it does, and if we see that every time there's a crash, uh, the people holding the bag are the ones who can't afford to. I mean, this is just, it, it's abusive, and it has to stop at some point, one assumes, whether it's, maybe it's just when people get out the pitchforks, and then it'll just reset anyway, right? Like. I said in one piece about a revolution that you kind of, the reason they call it that is because you're right back at the start where you, <laughs> because you look at like how the Soviet Union replaced one, uh, one kind of czarist another. system with another. with another, but I don't know, I just like to hope that there's, there's some, some better way to live. But again, like you say before, I like to think there is, but I don't know how to figure it out or make it happen. Yeah. I hope someone else does, but maybe not in my backyard, right? Well, maybe in yeah. the next project you'll work that one out. I hope so. I mean, I think uh, <laughs> I'm getting close. <laughs> but no, I, lo I love to work with this idea of, basically, I think it's, it's a giant shrug of the shoulders, my, my kind of practice as an artist. And that's why I think I feel so drawn to stand-up comedy as a, as a, mm. a way of of framing things, very American, of course, very New York. But, you know, it's an observational kind of thing where you're standing there and you, you, it's not like, you're, you know, comedians give you the answer like, ah, after 20 minutes of ranting about how insane everything is, let me tell you what to do. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm alluding in this film to that universal basic income because it seems very logical to me. But Would you, it work? But, Let's you, hope. but then there is a universal basic income, but as you point out, if there's a solar flare and all the electrical systems go out, then we really are back to square one again. Yeah. I mean, at least if we still use shells or dolphin teeth at that point, yeah. there'd be a, the basis of an economy. But yeah, imagine that. Imagine like if you just, I think in Canada, in fact, in a, a few years back, there was a solar flare. And for at least the regional area of Canada, the, the financial system was frozen. Yeah. You know, for a few hours, okay. But imagine if that two days, nobody could get cash. You know, things could Society break down breaks down very, very quickly. Very quickly. Yeah. I think it certainly breaks down faster than it's built up, doesn't yeah. it? And yeah, that's, that's uh, an interesting thing. I, well, maybe we don't need the solar flares. Maybe we just need, you know, more wildfires and freak yeah. rain things. But, you know, there seems to be a great instability. Gathering. Gathering. And, uh, you know, with the pandemic, but then again, the pandemic to me was a very interesting moment in terms of this project because it inspired a lot of the thinking. Looking at, okay, the government simply created new money to circulate it, to shore up, you know, there's many interpretations. Was it to shore up the system? Was it to benefit the elite? Uh, all of it at the same time, no doubt. But money was created. In fact, you know, something like 25% of all US dollars ever created were done in 2020, which is a pretty astonishing figure yeah. given the size of the U.S. economy and more so the importance of the U.S. dollar to the global economy. Yeah. So when you think about that, it's like, aha, uh -huh. in the midst of this crisis, something has been revealed that at the center of it, our economic institutions are fundamentally flexible. Yeah. And we can change them. Where they've always said they weren't. Right. No yeah. alternative, Ma Margaret yeah. Thatcher. There is no alternative. Of course there is. There always has been. And maybe within this kind of moment, we can see that whether, you know, you can actually make it happen because of course, you know, vested interests are what they are. And I don't know how open people are going to be to just say, let's have everyone be prosperous. Well, it's a nice idea. With your project and the, you know, universal basic income, we can work towards that. Um, thank you, Doc. No, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's a, it's wonderful to have to be able to do the project. It's wonderful here. for you to finally get over. Yeah, it. after a few uh, false starts, yeah. thanks to the pandemic. But thanks very much. Thank you.
columns and windows and all, uh, and all that sort of thing. And that, as far as I know, just they downed tools on that in 2008 when everything kind of dried up in the credit markets as the, in the downdraft of the boom and, and then the bust. So that that is a longstanding thing. And, you know, I found out about the phenomenon of the ghost estates quite late in my research. And of course, most of them have been repurposed or knocked down. I know at, at, at its peak, there were several thousand of such estates throughout the country, which is an amazing statistic to me in a country as small as Ireland. So, I mean, that that was, um, when I found out about that, it really, um, it really, crystallized something for me, this really amazing kind of metaphor for a lot of the broader issues I wanted to discuss. Uh, and, um, you know, especially it's also interesting that, you know, recently the estate has, or that again, it's not the entire Castle Lake uh, in Caratool that that was, was the source of my meditation, but one part of it, because, you know, there are parts of the place that are, you know, dwelled in and, and quite nice. But you know, it was. It's now uh, the part that I was looking at is now being finally, however many years, 13, 14 years later, repurposed and put to productive use. So um, Dawn and I were joking that you know, if the if the pandemic had let had led to too much delay, and they they wound up kind of rebuilding and reusing their site before the film came out, I would have looked pretty bad. It was like, no, no, that's not the derelict estate anymore. It's a school or whatever. So. These things are, my father always used to say, everything in life is about timing. Uh, and this is, it's proven one more time that he's right. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Um, another question from, a question from James Clegg. Um, he says the pandemic seems to have demonstrated that governments can do a lot of things they usually say they're un unable to, which you, you just covered um, sure. in, towards the end of the uh, conversation. He asks, do you think that the pandemic will usher in a change in how we think about economies? I hope so. I mean, I think, you know, it seems like, especially to all of us living through it, especially those of us with small kids in the house, that it's just been this endless sea of time, this pandemic. But, you know, in, in broader terms, it's not a great length of time that this disruption has been upon us. And I mean, I hope it's been long enough the, for people to rethink a lot of things and for those to be lasting. But I don't know, I mean, I guess it's a, I, I, it depends on how cynical one is. Like, you know, obviously uh, the broader powers that be benefit more from, you know, the system as it was than as it might be probably mm -hmm. in terms of whether people have more freedom in their lives to work from home and have more flexibility. And also I think a lot of those types of home working kind of possibilities are, are certainly not you know, democratic in their distribution. I mean, I, I'm as an artist and lecturer able to work from home, whereas somebody who doesn't have that kind of a job and is more tied to a site wouldn't be able to work from home. Mm. So it's really hard to know how, how I, I wonder how, how much more uh, apparent than real the, the sense of everything shifting in the workforce really is. I mean, to me and most of the people I know, there have been profound changes in how we relate to our work, but that's a small sliver of, it's not certainly a, a revealing cross section necessarily, but I certainly hope so. And I mean, this idea of the universal basic income is really, really fascinating to me. And at first I, mm -hmm. I like, I joke about it in the video because I like to, as is my want, I think I wouldn't it be great to just sit in a hammock and have people, you know, blip money into my account. Sure, I'd love that. Um, whether you call it a universal basic income or not, but, you know, is, is there a real basis for that? Not so done, but, you know, in a, in a more, you know, professional and serious way of doing that for, for most people. And if so, what does that really mean? I mean, I think to me, there opened up a lot of interesting conceptual possibilities, which I wonder whether the world is interested in trying to activate. Like if money isn't in, in fact a fiction, I don't know how we could argue that it isn't a fiction. I mean, when was it not? I mean, uh, you know, people who drone on about gold and money and, you know, buy gold and not. I looked into another metal called uh, Wolfram, tungsten, which is actually used as a, sometimes people use it to counterfeit gold because it looks alike and it has a very similar molecular structure. And in fact, it's much harder. So why not choose Wolfram and gold to base a, uh, you know, a hard currency environment. I don't know. 
But, you know, what would it mean if we all just stopped and said, hang on, we're caught up in this crazy treadmill and we're working like slaves for debts that were perhaps created just by a blip on a computer to maybe buy things we don't really want. And then at the end end of it, you're like, what was that all about? I mean, there might be a more interesting, interesting and, you know, profound and, you know, creative way of living. But think of the upheaval it would cause to try to actually make that happen. I don't know whether there's any reality to that as a possibility. That's why I like to gas on about such things. (laughs) I like to hope someone will make them policy at some point. Quick question from um, George Bolster. Do you feel your humor allows the audience into your concepts or access them more readily, especially when talking about complex ideas? I think so, because also, I mean, one of the nice things about it is it, it allows me to have a bit of an out, right? I mean, I, I certainly don't um, have the answers to complex. I think what, what has been proven is that no one has the answers to, mm. you know, highly complicated economic things, because every you know, 50 years or so, there's usually some kind of big change in the financial system, whether it was Bretton Woods and then the, the Nixon and the gold standard, like I go on about. So I don't know that anyone has the, the, the answer, but I think the nice thing about that kind of comic um, platform to me is that it allows you to sort of be observational and tangential about things. And mm. as I said in the video, shrug the shoulders without really... Um, uh, but also without having to commit too deeply to any kind of policy position, right? I mean, obviously, that's not the the, the, the point of a platform like mine isn't to, you know, go in for like, I'm not reading a policy paper. Yeah. But it's, I think it allows people to kind of, you know, like with all the other projects, the bananas or whatnot, just look at something that's there in front of them and be like, well, hang on, that is kind of nuts. And to me, when I when I see comedians that are able to, you know, do that. I mean, I don't, I don't consider myself a comedian. I think I'm using comic uh, gestures and, and kind of hopefully good comic timing now and again. But a, a proper comedian is a, is a whole nother level of magnitude, I think, because there's a real art to it. Because uh, it has to be funny. Being an art comedian, as it were, you can, you can tell jokes that bomb and say, well, no, no, I intended to do that. You see. Whereas if you did that on stage, they'd throw a beer bottle at you, get the hell off there. Um, so, but I think the comedian, the comic thing is even like what, what, even in general kind of speech making, you kind of like to warm up the crowd with a joke and this and that. It's a way of keeping attention without, without bogging down. But I think there is a real possibility for depth uh, that feels like it's surface. And to me, that's a very interesting, I would say, surface and depth are, you know, th- that, that relationship to me is very, very intriguing as an artist, because I think there's a lot to be played with there. For sure. Doug, um, we're running out of time, so I want to- I mean, I don't you. mind a few minutes after, if you want to go a we, few minutes later, since we- We're going to crack easy. on, because um, I think I wouldn't trust the Eventbrite setup. Oh, uh-huh, yeah, it might close us down. <laughs> But unfortunately so Doug really huge thanks um, no great thanks to everyone here. and also thanks, thanks to, to Alice again for... O'Donoghue um, behind the scenes that managed to uh, get us all all together yeah, eventually so thank you for that and but thanks um, to everyone for the time and thanks Don for the chance to, to do all. today thank and to do the project here it was great fun well thank you thanks to everybody thanks so much for your time thank you thanks all <laughs>